edits gaming coverage for NPR, and his day job is a producer for us at Here and Now. James, thank you. Thank you, Scott. You're listening to Here and Now. In Ghana, a pastor began treatment for HIV, and he was excommunicated by his church and shunned by his colleagues. But he found a new mission to create a home for children who are orphaned and stigmatized by HIV and AIDS. They are alive, they are happy to send two to a university, and that is the greatest joy. We visit the Motherly Love Orphanage in Accra on the world. Catch up with what's going on in the world Monday through Thursdays at 3 p.m. on Radio IQ. Radio IQ is supported in part by A.N. Culbertson and Company, independent wealth managers helping clients protect, grow, and transfer assets for 25 years. Fee-only advisors, Charlottesville. A.N. Culbertson.com. And from St. Mary's School, a college preparatory high school in Raleigh, North Carolina, for girls grades 9 through 12. Now scheduling visits. More at sms.edu slash WVTF. Funding for Here and Now comes from MathWorks, creators of MATLAB and Simulink software for technical computing and model-based design. MathWorks, accelerating the pace of discovery in engineering and science. Learn more at MathWorks.com. And WBUR presenting Endless Thread, a podcast about the Internet's untold histories and unsolved mysteries. From stories about a mountain of dishware in the woods to the world's largest secret glitter consumer. Endless Thread, where podcasts are available. It's here and now. Invasive species are threatening ecosystems around the world. One invader in the Pacific Northwest has generated a lot of, well, buzz. The northern giant hornet is called by some the murder hornet. And farmers worry that this giant hornet can slaughter a hive of honeybees in minutes. And ever since the first one showed up in North America three years ago, Officials in Washington State and British Columbia have been trying to eradicate the species. And now, researchers are partnering with scientists in Japan and Korea to try to outsmart the world's largest hornet. John Ryan of KUOW reports. Even the biggest insects' brains are very small, but not so small they can't communicate with each other. These are alarm calls that Asian honeybees make when threatened by giant hornets. Researchers recorded these sounds at beehives in Vietnam. The bees vibrate their little bodies and hold them against a solid object to amplify the alarm signal. The quick communication helps them mount a collective defense against much larger predators. But insects don't just communicate with sound, they communicate with smell. Researchers are hoping to use one aroma of the world's largest hornet to lure it to its doom. This is a northern giant hornet. That's not an alarm signal. It's just the hornet's wings beating. Hornets emit certain chemicals, pheromones, to signal danger to each other. When a hornet stings, the stinger releases venom and a sort of chemical alarm. Jacqueline Serrano is an entomologist with the Federal Agricultural Research Service in Washington State. If you see someone messing with, like, a, you know, a bald face hornet nest or a yellow jacket nest or something, they usually get swarmed, right? As they get stung, more and more alarm pheromones going to get released, so they'll just keep attacking it until it's no longer a threat. In the world of insect communication, pheromones are strong language. One billionth of a gram can convince a hornet to go on the attack. The idea with something like an alarm pheromone is that we can hopefully attract them from, yeah, several kilometers away. To attract these unwanted invaders, agriculture officials and volunteers have been setting out traps in the northwest corner of Washington state. The recommended bait is a mix of rice wine and orange juice. But that can draw in lots of different insects, even beneficial ones. Alarm pheromones should only attract the target species. And not have to deal with gross rice wine and orange juice and a bunch of fruit flies and a bunch of nasty bycatch. Serrano has been testing different lures at sites in Washington. But there's a problem. Nobody has spotted a giant hornet in North America since the summer of 2021. That's when insect specialists found and destroyed three of the invaders' nests in Washington's Whatcom County. So Serrano is partnering with researchers who live where there's no shortage of giant hornets. Hideshi Naka is an entomologist at Totori University in Japan. There are northern giant hornets everywhere, even in the middle of large cities that Americans would know of. Normally, there are northern giant hornets flying around. 
Naka says the hornets are a familiar part of Japanese life, as well as a big problem for Japanese farmers and their honeybees. Most Japanese people know that if you are stung by a hornet twice, you will die, so they will immediately go to the hospital. Many Japanese farmers use traps to keep hornets away from their beehives. Giant hornets can destroy a whole beehive in a matter of minutes. Gyeongbuk University researcher Che Moon Bo says some South Korean beekeepers even swat away hornets of various species with badminton rackets. He recorded this giant hornet buzzing for this story. Naka and Che are testing the pheromone traps to help Americans with our giant hornet problem, but they say there's not much use for such traps in their countries. Here's Hideshi Naka again. In Japan.
The 2 p.m. Council session of Roanoke City Council uh, is hereby called to order uh, on January the 17th. And I'm going to ask our clerk, Ms. Susan McCoy, to please call the roll. Mr. Pretty? Here. Vice Mayor Cobb? Here. Ms. White Boyd? Here. Mr. Bollison? Here. Ms. Moon Reynolds? Here. Ms. Sanchez Jones? Here. And Mayor Lee? Here. And a quorum is present. Let me say the council meetings will be televised live and replayed on RVTV Channel 3 on Thursdays at 7 o'clock p.m. and Saturdays from 10 a.m. to 5 o'clock p.m. That's a continue. Sorry. Is that me? That was me, Mayor. Sorry. Thank you. Okay. All right, when you hear the sounds go off, man. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and Saturdays from 10 a.m. to 5 o'clock p.m. and video stream through Facebook Live at facebook.com Royal VA. Council meetings are offered with closed captioning for the deaf or hard of hearing. And today, I'm pleased to recognize our Vice Mayor who will lead us in our invocation and following his invocation, I will lead you in the Pledge of Allegiance. Please stand and the recognize Vice Mayor Carl. Loving Spirit, thank you for the gift of this day and for the weekend that we are emerging from, celebrating the life and legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. We thank you for this extraordinary city and all of the ways that we gathered together and were present with each other whether it was remembering fragments from his speeches or delivering portions of his letter from Birmingham jail or engaging in acts of service that remind us that we need each other. We also know that love is the only true power that can transform our lives and our world. And so in celebration of his life and legacy and the power of love, that is present within each of us. May we do all we can as a council, as a city, as residents, to love one another and to continue acting in love and service toward and with each other in the days and year to come. In your holy name I pray, amen. Amen. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Vice Mayor, and let me welcome everybody to our afternoon session today. We have another session planned for 7 o'clock tonight, and so, uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, there are no announcements that we have today, so we'll go right on into the agenda with presentations and acknowledgments, and we have none. And we also, item number three is the hearing of citizens upon public matters. City Council sets this time as a priority for citizens to be heard. All matters will be referred to the city manager now for a response or recommendation or report to council as he may deem appropriate. All right, so at this time, I'm going to ask the clerk, do we have any citizens that have signed up to be heard? Yes, we do. We have two citizens. The first is John Brown and then Frida Cathcart. All right, Mr. Brown. Come on up and welcome to Roanoke City Council. I'd like to take this time to thank everybody, councilmen, city manager, ladies and gentlemen. Um, we're here about the comp compensation study. We understand it's been a time consuming process and we also recognize the hard work that everybody's trying to do to resolve this. But with that being said, you know, it's kind of hard to um, 
really put this in context when right now we have people coming in the door making three to four dollars more than what I'm doing. At fifteen dollars an hour, they're hiring people at eighteen seventy-five. Some are making twenty dollars an hour. We think that's totally unfair, and we'd like to know what they're going to do to bring us up equitably, and how we're going to go forward with this because it's been said that um, it would be performance based. We've been at the city or at public works without a raise for a couple of years now. So we feel that we should be up to that level, their level, and raises going forward should be performance based. And that's all I have. Thank you. Well, I'll, I'll let our city manager speak to that issue. Since only here. Yeah, and, and what I'm going to suggest one is that Mr. Brown speak with Clarence, you know Clarence obviously, to get an update um, on where things are. I do want to make one correction in that all of the employees have uh, both this year and the previous year received pay increases. I do want to make that correction. We have two actual efforts that are going on right now, uh, well, three if you count public safety for compensation increases. One of those is the compensation study that was referred to. And that compensation study is to set the stage for the FY24 request. So that'll be the budget that we're creating. Um, in addition to public safety, though, there was also some funds that council um, approved in this year's budget, which allows us to get a head start on, on some of the employees. And we'll be actually finalizing that at probably your next meeting, I think, is the plan for that. And there's actually a communication, literally today, a communication came across my desk of what those recommendations are as we go forward. But uh, Clarence can fill them in uh, privately as well as on kind of where things are overall with it and stuff. So, all right, Mr. Brown, uh, Mr. Greer is in the back. Like that. He'll see you. Okay. And talk to you about that. Thank all you. All right. I sure appreciate so, your time. Okay. Uh, excuse me, Mr. Bam, may I make a statement as well, a comment? Uh, uh, not only for the gentleman that spoke in the department, but perhaps uh, either uh, the Department of uh, Director of General Services or even the department manager, I think may need to speak with all the employees in public work so they would all receive the same information. Yeah. And, and that commu the communication that goes out, as does in all instances, will go out to every single employee. Yeah. Um, so all of the employees will receive the communication, and then the directors will reinforce those messages as well. Right, but that's what I'm saying. Maybe perhaps meet with them in a group than just sending it through email because they may interpret it differently than the, hearing it. The directors meet vocal. with them yes. as a group. They, they already do that, so yeah. yes, and they will continue to do that. Yeah, it's so. obvious that uh, somewhere the wires have gotten crossed no, and they don't understand. No, I, no it, yeah, I understand. that's not correct. I just right. want to be clear yeah. that, again, the information that was provided relative to compensation is the compensation study is for FY24. That message has been very clear. The employees are aware of that. I think the concern that's being expressed is the concern about employees that are coming in currently and what they're getting paid for. So I just want to be clear on, right. on that. Right, and that's what I'm saying. I, I'm sorry I wasn't clear on my part. That they are, I know what they're saying, that those that come in under temp uh, agencies are making more than they are. And I just think they just need to have some clear clarification on that, whether that's through their manager or the director. Well, we're going to leave that to Thank you. Mr. Greer. will go ahead and have that and share with you, and he'll talk to you in the back. All right? Okay, um, Madam Clerk. Um, Frida Cathcart. Do I have five minutes then? Um, yes. You do. Okay. I'm waiting for it to say that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I had a very inspirational Martin Luther King weekend. I hope you all did, too. I found the message on Saturday at the SELC luncheon inspiring about racial hypnosis. And then yesterday at um, the North Carolina AT&T um, breakfast, there was a message about the importance of communication. Um, and I've been reflecting recently about Estelle McCadden, who I'm excited is being considered to have a park named after her, and um, she's so deserving of that. And what an inspiration she was to me and other neighborhood leaders um, to really make a difference in our communities and to, to listen to our neighbors um, and to engage with the city to make transformative changes to benefit everyone. Um, 
So I hope that the council will, will support that um, naming of a park in her honor. But I really want to encourage council and the city um, staff um, and neighborhood leaders and the community at large to think about her work and what she did and how she brought people together and um, her unfailing spirit to keep going in the face of adversity. Um, and just the grace in which she carried herself is admi admirable. Um, Thomas Porter um, wrote a book in the spirit of the art of conflict transformation about creating a culture of just peace. And that conflict is a result of differences that produce tension. And humans have an inclination to avoid conflict and tension. Um, but the problem is, um, if, if you allow that to happen, if you don't have those communication, those bridgers to bring people together, um, there's, a, there's a quote from him that says, um, the assumption leads to hiding conflicts, covering them up or stifling them. What is unnamed and unengaged lies just beneath the surface. The conflict gets worse until it explodes in very destructive ways. We must name and engage conflict to heal and transform our communities and ourselves. Um, recently, I've been working with our neighborhood association and the city um, with an ongoing conflict. It goes back um, to 2014 um, when I was looking through things. You know, those who don't learn from history are, are doomed to repeat it and, it, and it seems like here we go again. And I, I came across this email, um, part of it, I'm going to read to you. It says, my response will only address the concerns about Fishburne Park and the desire to develop a healthy communication policy with Roanoke City neighborhood leaders are priceless volunteers giving their time for a mostly thankless job. It is not the responsibility of, the, of these volunteers to make sure the appropriate people and the greater community are contacted when there are changes that will affect public amenities or to make sure tax dollars are wisely and efficiently invested. It is the responsibility of the elected city officials and city government to notify and involve the greater community about changes to public amenities. If the greater community is not involved, then the city should not be surprised if there are questions about proposed changes, especially when previous promises were made that would protect the health of the public, as well as when laws to preserve our environment and heritage might be in the process of being neglected. It would be helpful if Roanoke City would develop a comprehensive policy to improve communication between the city and the greater community that isn't based on volunteers, but utilizes many free resources. The public deserves an easy way to access pr proposed changes and provide comments without having to attend a meeting. I sent that email to city council and the city um, government management in 2015. And I could have wrote, written it yesterday. So I really want to work with you to learn from the past to create a transformative future. So I'm not writing the same thing again in seven years. I look forward to doing that with you. Thank you. Thank you. Does that conclude the yes, speaker's sir. madam clerk? Yes, it does. All right, thank you. We're gonna move <coughs> to the next item on our agenda, which is the consent agenda. All matters are listed under the consent agenda are considered to be routine by members of city council and will be enacted by one motion. There will be no separate discussion of the items. If discussion is desired, the item will be removed from the consent agenda and considered separately. I want to call your attention to three requests for closed meetings. Uh, the first one from council member Patricia Whiteboard, who is the chair of our city council personnel committee, requesting that council convene in a closed meeting to discuss a personnel matter, being the mid-year performances of council appointed officers pursuant to section 2.2-3711 Code of Virginia as amended. From the city manager, there's a request 
for a closed meeting to discuss a prospective business or industry or the expansion of an existing business or industry in southeastern in the southeastern area of the city of Roanoke where discussion in an open meeting would adversely affect the bargaining position or negotiating strategy of the public body pursuant to section 2.2-3711 uh, Code of Virginia as amended. And thirdly, from the city manager, is he's requesting a closed meeting to discuss the disposition of publicly owned property located at 339 Salem Avenue Southwest, where discussion in an open meeting would adversely affect the bargaining position or negotiating strategy of the public body pursuant to Section 2.2-3711, 8.3, Code of Virginia, as amended. I need a motion for the consent agenda approval. So moved. Second. All right, Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Mr. Pretty. Aye. Vice Mayor Cobb. Aye. Ms. White Boyd. Aye. Mr. Vollison. Aye. Ms. Moon Reynolds. Aye. Ms. Sanchez Jones. And Mayor Lee. Aye. And the consent agenda is approved. Did you say, I didn't hear you. Did, did you she speak did. on this yes, one? Yes, she did. Okay. Uh, I'm, you know, I'm hearing. I need to, you probably need to, and Mike, to help me out. <laughs> but you're fine. Just want to make sure we get that. Thank you. All right, the regular agenda. Item, uh, we're down to item number five, public hearings. We have none. Petitions and communications, none. Reports of city officers and comments of a city manager. Uh, and uh, item 7-1 is briefings, and I'm pleased to call on our city manager to introduce the briefing. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Uh, we have one uh, briefing today, and that is a briefing from the Health District, from Dr. Morrow. Um, and this is something we've talked about for a couple of months, I think, of being able to do, and the time seemed appropriate to do so. And you should have this presentation at your um, seat as well. And with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Morrow. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's so good to be here. I, I don't have an ask. Um, I'm here because I think and I'm here with Christy Wills, who's our communications officer. I think all of you know her. Um, I think it's really important for us as public servants to make sure that we are held accountable for what we do at the health department. And so what I'd like to do is present our annual report, which you have in front of you. It's our first annual report, um, 2021. So it's all of the services that we provide uh, across the seven localities that we serve. Um, and Christy and I are already starting to work on our 2022. So it does take us some time to make sure we have all of our year end stuff in place. Um, but we'll, we'll present that to you, um, give that to you at, at some point in the future. Hopefully not as late as this one. But with that, I want to go ahead and talk a little bit about the public health system, make sure we're all on the same page of what we do with the intention of this just informing you guys about what the state of Roanoke City's health is. Um, and how we try to improve the health of the communities that we serve, really with the intent of if you have any questions for me or any ideas of what we can be doing differently, we are all ears. We want to know from you how we can better serve our community. So with that, um, I, I, I'm going to be doing this at the different localities. This is the first one, so thank you so much, Bob, for <laughs> allowing me to be here. Um, just really quickly, I'm not going to go through all of the slides because that would take a long time. Uh, I'm going to go through a few of them. But one of the most important things is to understand what health is. So when we talk about health, we're talking about the physical, social, and mental well-being of the community that we serve, not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. And that is the World Health Organization's definition. Public health is to assure the conditions in which people can be healthy. So it is impossible for us to be healthy if we do not have clean air, clean water, clean food. Those are the basic minimums. So we definitely do that. I think most of you know we're, we're, we're out there doing, when I say we, it might be at the state level. So clean water is at the state level. Um, safe food is at the local level. Um, and clean air is also at the state level. But if there's a concern, we'll work with our state counterparts to make sure that we're addressing them. Um, 
this is the framework for public health. We have three core functions, assessment, policy development, and assurance. Uh, assessment means it is our job to make sure we know what's going on in the community, and that's part of what I'm going to be presenting today. Um, policy development, program services that we do, um, and then assurance, making sure that everybody has equitable access to the services and programs. And as you can see, equity is the center of everything that we do. It, it moves everything that we are. Um, this is just super brief, our, our area, our region. And then this is the area, these are the jurisdictions that we serve. In order to make sure that we have benchmarkable outcomes that we're talking about, it's important to make sure that we're looking at apples to apples. Um, and so the, the county health rankings is a model that is used across the country for every county in the country. Now we can't compare Virginia to Texas or New York. We can only compare counties within a, within a state. And these are the, the, mark, the um, indicators that we use. So most of the data that I'm gonna present are from the county health rankings, again, because it's a single place where you can find this information on any county anywhere in the country. Um, but there are gonna be some data from what's called the CARES portal, that's the VDH uh, data portal, and, and I'll, I'll be happy to share that more, more information about that for anyone who's interested. The 2022 health rankings, um, show that Roanoke City is in the bottom quartile, which is not a surprise, I'm sure, to anybody, for both health outcomes and health factors. So we're gonna break that down a little bit. With respect to health outcomes, premature death is the strongest marker with the health outcomes. Self-reported wellness or illness um, is also one of the, the markers. But when we look at premature death, um, so Roanoke County is where, I mean, Roanoke City, excuse me, is wherever there's the, the star. In the corner, I've put what the leading causes of death are in Roanoke City. This is from our CARES portal. And I want to point out that cancer is the leading cause of death in under the age of 75 um, in Roanoke City. And this compares to leading cause of death of, of um, heart disease in most of the country. Heart disease is second, accidents, and the way that we code accidents, um, overdoses are considered accidents. Um, so you can see we're disproportionately impacted there. And then diabetes and chronic lower, uh, lower respiratory disease. If we look at avoidable hospitalizations, these data are from the CARES portal. I wanted to put, point these out for Roanoke City because we are so disproportionately high with respect to asthma hospitalizations and with respect to, to diabetes hospitalizations. These are not areas that the health department works on. Um, in Virginia, we, are not, we do, not, do not have funding to look at chronic diseases. Um, I'm hopeful that that will change at the state level, but Virginia is not funded to focus on chronic disease, even though chronic disease are now our leading causes of death. So that's just something to be aware of and something that perhaps we can partner on together at, you know, at a different time. This is just information sharing at this point. If we look at other data, these data are now, all of the graphs are data from the county health rankings. So if we look at other data, alcohol impaired driving deaths, um, of the Roanoke Valley area were the highest, adult smoking, highest, STIs, which we will definitely talk about in a little bit, way, way disproportionately impacted, and teen births. Both STIs and teen births are things that we have been focusing on the last couple of years um, with the Roanoke City <coughs> Health Department and some of the funding that we've gotten in the past local match we have done, we've, we've been using to address teen, teen births. Socioeconomic factors, you are all very familiar with these, um, children in poverty and food insecurity. We are too high. And then in injury, in injury deaths and drug overdose deaths, um, again, we're disproportionately high. Homicide suicides, disproportionately high, with the exception in, our, in the jurisdictions that the Roanoke City Allegheny Health District serves of Covington. Uh, that's probably in part small number variation. Um, so that's a really super quick overview of the state of the city's health. And any questions that you have about more details, I'd be happy to, to go into that. But I also want to share what we do um, with the, the JLR formula, with the, the way that um, 
health departments across the state are funding, you are funding a significant portion of the work that we do, about $1.5 million worth of, of, of um, services. So it's important for me that you know what we do. Here is our organizational chart. Emphasis on clinical services, emergency preparedness, um, environmental health, and epidemiology is probably where you hear us the most, COVID, COVID, and a little bit more COVID. And then we'll sprinkle in some hepatitis A here and there. That's what we're doing. We're spending a lot of time doing investigations, trying to make sure that we're addressing any communicable disease threat um, within our community. So an example of our clinical services, um, we saw that our teen birth rates are very high in the city um, relative to the rest of, re the rest of our region. Um, we provide family planning services. And here are just strict numbers of services not broken down by, the, by city, but the services that we provide. Um, and we can, we can in the future present data at the more granular level at the city, if that is of interest. Immunizations, other than COVID, over 6,000 immunizations. Newcomer health for our refugee population, over 120 servants, uh, s uh, clients served. Um, and our STIs, and I wanted to point that out, our STIs, we are disproportionately um, serving Roanoke City intentionally because that's where the burden of disease is. And have you guys seen our dash van? Have any of you seen our dash vehicle? Our dash vehicle is out there trying to make sure that we're increasing access to what we call STI Go, where we can use the restroom of a brick and mortar place, but bring our staff in and um, provide on-site STI testing to try to make sure that we're testing and treating individuals and decrease that risk of STIs in our community. Um, and then TB services, um, we provide TB services. Um, if we think about emergency preparedness, I think everybody knows now that that's part of what we do. Um, and just that's how many vaccines were delivered within our, our jurisdictions, um, not all by us, of course. Um, and then we wanted to point out the Medical Reserve Corps, we could not have done what we did with the COVID response without our MRC volunteers. And all of those volunteers uh, fall under our larger umbrella of emergency preparedness. Environmental health, we inspect restaurants, we do septic systems, um, we do wells, we have our lead program, we have an amazing nurse epidemiologist who makes sure that any child who's identified with an elevated lead level gets case, individual case management to assure that we're making sure that that child is in an environment that decreases their risk of lead exposure um, and ultimately that lead is resolved. Um, rabies, uh, post-exposure prophylaxis, if you have a constituent who has a bat in their house, we're gonna take care of that constituent. Or a rabid fox, we had someone, a child get pulled out of a car um, by a rabid fox this year crazy stories. Um, recreational water, that should be water. Um, we make sure that all of the swimming pools are safe. Um, and then hotels, motels, of course. So these are the things that we're doing every day to protect the health of our community. Um, I mentioned rabies. People are really typically interested in rabies. <laughs> Here, just some data on the number of investigations we do, how many are human victim. Um, and th when I say that, that means that there's a potential exposure. We make sure that they get rabies post-exposure prophylaxis so that they don't get rabies, which universally kills if you get it. So we're gonna make sure that anybody who's potentially exposed gets the treatment that they need and deserve. And then epidemiology. We're known for, as I said, COVID and um, most recently hepatitis A. But there are over 70 reportable conditions, and we investigate each and every one of those reportable, reportable conditions. And this is just an example of our hepatitis A outbreak and the cost to our society for hepatitis A. It's gone up. We're now at about $3.5 million in cost for this, um, this massive outbreak that we had. Um, it's, we're actually going to get published in the CDC's MMWR because of the extent of this. Uh, so once that comes out, I will share that with you because that's, that's for, for those of you, the Centers for Disease Control MMWR is the place to publish important 
infectious disease information. So unfortunately, we warranted getting published in that. Um, and that should be coming out any time in the next month or two. And then we provide family services. It's really important in the city of Roanoke that we, we try to ensure that our, ch our families are served by CHIP or Healthy Families because those two organizations provide far more comprehensive services than we do. We think that it is a disservice to have someone participate in our baby care program if they are eligible for um, CHIP or Healthy Families because they provide more services. But if for any reason they're not eligible for those two programs, we're there as their safety net. Early intervention, we are unlike most health departments in that we run the early intervention program. The early intervention program is a federally mandated program for any child identified as having a developmental delay. Um, that child is entitled to an assessment and services if they qualify. And we organize that and, and um, administer that at the Roanoke City Health Department. And then I think a lot of people know we do screening for Medicaid for long-term care, um, home, home health services. Um, with respect to our early intervention, we serve a huge number of children. Um, in the course of a year, over 260 cases opened. Population health, we want to make sure that no child is injured because they don't have a car seat. So we will make sure that children have car seats. We'll do an education system uh, service. With some funding from the city, we made sure that children who needed a pack and play for safe sleep received a pack and play. Um, that's one of the things, the leading cause of preventable infant mortality, the leading causes of infant mortality, children dying below the, ages of, of the age of one, are congenital anomalies and extremely low birth weight or prematurity. But the most significant cause of a preventable death is an unsafe sleep environment. And so we want to do whatever we can, even if it's one child, that one child, we must prevent that, that one injury. So we will make sure that not only are we distributing car seats, but we're distributing pack and plays to, to families who need them. And then we run the WIC program. WIC is one of those services that the return on investment is extraordinary across the country. Um, and it is a huge privilege for us to be able to administer the WIC program here to ensure that all pregnant persons, nursing persons, and children under the age of five have access to nutrition, nutritious foods and education. So that is a really super quick, did I do it in less than 20 minutes, Bob? <laughs> um, super quick overview of the state of the city's health and what we're doing to support the city. We hope, Christy and I really hope that moving forward, we are here to serve you and to serve the community. And it's really important for us for you to know what we're doing. So that's, that's all I have. Christy, did you want to add anything? No, thank you. <laughs> all right, any questions from you? Well, I'll open it up and uh, let me start with Ms. Sanchez and I'll come to you right now. <coughs> Thank you so much for, I know you didn't sleep during the COVID season or <laughs> epidemic, so um, I hope you have recovered from that. But I'm interested in finding out about the STI numbers. Uh, are they middle school to high school or older than that? So it depends on the STI. Um, the most common STI is chlamydia, then gonorrhea. Um, thankfully, our HIV numbers are, are low. We want to keep, keep them that way. But each one of them is a little bit different. In general, we see the biggest burden of STIs in our young women. So women between the ages of 15 and, and 30. Are, that's going to be where the majority of um, burden is. We have what we're, we've also started, um, we've just started it, so it's not quite monthly yet but a monthly communicable disease newsletter for our, that's geared towards our healthcare providers and our service providers. And we're gonna do a year in review and we're gonna highlight some of those questions about STIs in that year in review. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things, Chris, maybe we can do is send that newsletter to the council as well. Yes. Um, and that'll give you a, a breakdown. We actually even look at the data by zip code um, so that we know where we should be targeting some of our efforts. But Young, young girl, young teenagers to, to mid-20s, high-20s is the, is the biggest burden. Okay. 
because at one point my understanding was that middle school age students were a high uh, risk. Um, from a numbers perspective, not so much, but I would say that any child who's diagnosed with an STI needs, that needs to be investigated because no child should have an STI. Um, not here, but you know, where I used to work, we had a nine-year-old who had um, gonorrhea, and that was an immediate working with CPS to identify what had happened to that child, that that child was exposed. Um, so thankfully, the numbers are small, but the impact is huge, even if we only have a few, a small number of middle age, middle age, <laughs> middle school children, we want to make sure that we're protecting them because no child should have an STI. And one more question. And yeah. do you know if the school nurses are equipped for testing for STIs? Um, that's a good question that I don't know the answer to. Okay. To my knowledge, they, they, they cannot do a diagnosis. There's not a standing order. They would have to do a referral. Um, thankfully, we have a really good relationship with um, Carilion Clinic, which, which is responsible for all of the school nurses. Um, they have an amazing program in place for adolescent health. Um, but I can definitely, talk, there's, I, I can't envision a situation unless there's a physician or an NP or a PA mm -hmm. on site, they won't be able to do the okay. testing there. Does, does that help? Yeah, oh, yes, it's, it's clear. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you very much. Welcome. <laughs> thank you, Mayor. Uh, Dr. Morrow, thank you for being here. Christy, oh, thanks for having thank me. you. Um, I have a couple of questions, kind of wide ranging. Um, the first one I want to ask you about is on page five, uh, the slide that talks about avoidable hospitalizations. Yes. And you talk here about um, diabetes and asthma, but I'm, I'm particularly interested in asthma. Um, and I'm curious if you have a ratio of how many of these hospitalizations are adults, how many are children. The reason I ask this yeah. is because with CHIP, Child, Investment, mm -hmm. Child Health Investment Partnership, yeah. They work with a lot of families, and one of the, their concerns for a number of years has been the, the level of uh, asthma yes. at a younger age, due in part to, or just respiratory, respiratory illnesses, due in part to um, bad air in, in the environments they're living in, apartments they're living in, um, lead, uh, black mold that's, that's un detected or untreated and I just wondered if you had any more data about it, those hospitalizations or if that's a deeper dive we could look at another time that's that's a deeper dive that I would be happy to look at those data are not publicly available data but but we can definitely talk with the state so the way these data are generated it's from the hospital reporting system so VHHA um, but we can definitely get more granular. Uh, to, I, I need to disclose that I was on the board of CHIP for a long time, and so I'm very familiar with um, that. There are a lot of health departments that are funded to do case management of asthma. We talked about we do case management for um, rabies and for lead. We do not do case management for asthma. There are there are quite a few health departments across the country that do case management for asthma with the idea that you have an environmental health specialist go into the home and do an assessment. Are there roaches in the home, which can be a, a significant source of, a, of an asthma trigger? Is there the mold that you're talking about? What is the state of the mattress? Can you replace the mattress? There, there are at, mm -hmm. sort of asthma safe mattresses and pillows. Um, we are not funded to do that, and that's something that, you know, if, if you'd like us to take a look at, I can certainly give you um, the evidence base behind doing that, and we can, we can talk about that offline. Um, we know that public health intervention for children who have a high risk of absent school absenteeism because of asthma and because of hosp uh, hospitalizations due to asthma, having this intervention is evidence-based, it's well-proven, yeah. it is costly. Well, and, and obviously it's, it's multifaceted because you can, even if you have the funding to, to buy a new uh, hypoallergenic mattress and pillows, if the living environment exactly. is not conducive to supporting that, it's, it's almost pointless yeah. to buy the and, new and stuff. That's, and that's one of the things that, again, 
be happy to talk offline. Sure. You know, so, so there are different levels of evidence, but the intervention itself is, is evidence-based of having someone go in. But you're absolutely right, depending on the root cause of what that exacerbation is. And one of the things that we know, too, is that the medical management, in the ideal world, we control the environment so the child doesn't need to be on medication. But we know that usually with the families that have children who have... Um, who are repeatedly being hospitalized and who have, who have a high absenteeism. There's so many different social determinants of health that are going on. Um, any intervention can, can help them, even if that intervention is at the medication level. While that's not ideal, that's better than nothing, to, yeah. if that makes sense. Yeah, no, thank you. Absolutely. Um, I, I know you didn't really address this in the uh, presentation, but um, I was recently talking with um, the lead chaplain at Carillion who shared that they're at capacity in terms of uh, access to hospital beds. And when, I, when asking why, he said, it's a combination. Staffing. It's COVID, it's RSV, it's the flu. Yeah. Could, do you, can you talk a little bit about what you're seeing from through the health department about those three? Sure. So, and one of the key things about is, is it's true that those all hit us hard in the fall really hard in the fall there also was a huge staffing issue so there were quite a few empty beds because they just didn't have the staff okay. to so, so from from you know again root sure. cause analysis there was the staffing issue but from the disease issue rsv hit hard september really it peaked and it and and it has it's gotten much much better flu we're still in high activity based on the most recent graph um, which was through january 7th published january 14th but the curve for influenza was it, it went straight up and now it's going straight down Good. so we expect that there's significant relief um, from flu a on the very near horizon the hospitals should not be Good. experiencing a lot of flu now that said the last few years, we've had bimodal peaks, so a late A or a, or a B, not a few years, because for the last few years, we have no flu, in, you know, flu activity, but prior to that. Um, so we're not out of the woods. Flu could come back, and, and it may come back as, as flu B. Um, right now, the biggest threat to our hospitals is COVID. Um, and thankfully, if we look at some of the bigger indicators, like our wastewater surveillance, it doesn't look like we're gonna see January of 2022. It doesn't look like we're gonna see January of 2021. We have seen an increase. It, it doesn't look like it's gonna be anything like those two years. Good. So fingers crossed the hospitals have seen the worst of it, <laughs> but it is too early to tell. Great. And the last question is just um, about Narcan training. I think you all do that. Um, and, and you do that in collaboration with other community partners? Yes, yes. So um, we, we haven't spent all, and this, this could take a long time just to talk about our substance use disorder and everything that's going on with substance use disorder. We are so fortunate in this community that we have so many partners. Of course, Virgin, Virginia Harm Reduction Drop-In Centers. Um, I know that the city is very supportive of Bradley Free Clinic and the work that they do. Um, so we're really, really lucky that we have so many partners that are invested and involved in this response. We have applied to a few different grants. Um, we haven't heard back yet whether we're, we're getting them. We are on the radar uh, for the state for some funding that's coming starting in July 2023. Um, they've said that they're going to include us, Roanoke City, in that funding. And we're really hopeful that we, the health department, can continue to increase access through NAR of Narcan training. But also, um, we think that part of our role is the assessment function and making sure that we have real-time data with OD maps. Um, it'll be our job to translate real-time substance use data into policy change in action. Um, but yes, we're hopeful that we can expand all of those with some, some funding. Thank you. Thank You're welcome. You all right. Uh, yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, um, Mr. Mayor. 
I, I really appreciate you coming down, um, Dr. Morrow, to, to give us a, a report. Like I said, this is the first time we've, I've gotten one, and I, I think the first time that you've ever done one. It was a lot of information, and I want to say thank you for putting that together, and thank you, Christy, for, for getting a, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of folks vaccinated during COVID. We became BFFs um, <laughs> in 2020, um, but you, 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 know, you helped me get a lot of work um, uh, done in our community. But I was going <clears> to <throat> ask something, um, Vice Mayor Cobb, mentioned about the uh, Narcan, but I was going to ask you about the overdoses. That's really complex. So do you think that you would be able to come back and maybe talk to us about what we're doing, mitigation? And Because I was really surprised to see it on here, on your report. So that means that you're, you're, you're reporting and you're involved to some degree, not just with the overdoses, but with the homicides and the suicides. So you're reporting, but I'm not sure what your role is in that from, from, the, from the health department standpoint. But I, don't, I certainly wouldn't want to do that to you right now, having uh, all the information you just put together and provided. But do you think at some point, and, and that was another question I was going to ask, how, how often do you think you might be able to come and, and uh, do a briefing with us on um, your as your often as you would like me to as often as you would like <laughs> you know I well. really I really believe that my job is to serve you so any way that I can do that um, I think it'd be we'd be happy to provide a focus a deeper dive I, on I substance would like use that. disorder and, and, I, um, I, and I'm sure some of the other members of council would probably yeah. appreciate that too but I would like a little deeper dive in that Absolutely. issue because our, you saw our numbers. I mean, you you, yes. you did the oh, report. We know, yeah. We, yeah. So um, that would be good. And thanks again for, for coming down and sharing this information with you. It's such a pleasure. Thanks yeah. for having me. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Mayor. All right, Ms. Paulson. Uh, thank you for coming, Dr. Morrow. Of course. I think it was really insightful to see how much higher we are than our neighbors in a lot of these things, and we have a lot of work to do in public health. Um, one of the things I was noticing is, of course, the STIs and, and pregnancies are up. It, is there a trend that we're noticing over time? Are they going down? Are they going up? That's a, it's a, that's a great question. Um, you know, COVID really confused our trend lines. Um, so we had, th there has been a fairly steady increase in STIs um, and then things decreased during COVID. Of course, people were not getting out as much. Mm -hmm. um, but we were really concerned in July, August of this past year, we saw a, a, just a really steep increase. Mm. We even, um, we, we, we did some press on it because we were really concerned and we thought it was really important to get some information out there um, to the community. Thankfully that has calmed down. Mm. So that could have just been a blip of people getting tested. Um, Regardless, so the trend is increasing, not as steeply as we thought a few months ago. <laughs> I need to be honest about that. But I think that the big thing is that comparison. It's so different than our surrounding communities. We know we, know we can do better and we have to do better. And that's one of the challenges with any communicable disease. Once it's in a community, it just perpetuates. So trying to break that, that cycle is really, really challenging. I also had a, a kind of policy question on that. Is there <clears throat> in Roanoke City Schools, do we use abstinence-based um, sexual education? That's a good question that I don't know the answer to. I don't believe so, yeah. but I don't know. Does, any, does anyone know? No. Nope. We will... We'll, well, I'll ask a school board member <laughs> that. <laughs> I, I, I would think not, but, yeah. but I, I don't know. Okay. Uh, and then the last thing I wanted to ask you about is monkeypox. Um, and how that's doing. Uh, I know that we had an outbreak. We were worried about that for a while. Has that calmed down? Yeah, so, so it was interesting. Um, and I don't know that we can draw this correlation. I've got to be super transparent about that. But when the MPOX outbreak <coughs> occurred across the globe, that coincided with that big increase in STIs that we were seeing in terms of July, August. Um, different demographic. Um, so the M MPOX cases are almost exclusively in the MS in the MSM population, men who have sex with men population, um, whereas our chlamydia and gonorrhea are disproportionately impacting our, our young women. Um, but, and I cannot say this, this is not causal, but we, I think that perhaps some of that really broad-based education about risky sex behaviors may have helped decrease that big increase. I don't know that. 
I'm hopeful that that meant that some of the public messaging was, work, was working. We have not had any cases in our jurisdictions since August. Great. Great. So. Yeah, Thank so you. that's yeah, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Thank you. They've changed the name to it now. It's MPOX. Yes, yeah. sorry. Yes, they changed okay. the name to MPOX. Okay. Recently, and they've given us a year to change it, so, you know, to get used to the I new language. You. I got you. <laughs> All right, I'm going to come back. I'm going to go to Ms. Moon Reynolds now, and I'm going to come back because you had a follow up with, with Ms. Cobb. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, Ms. Thank, Moon you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just wanted to ask you the question, and if you could elaborate a little bit on this new variant that has now come about. I understand that it's stronger, the strand is a lot stronger than the one, I guess, before. And I just want to also know how, what is the exposure in the valley as uh, in, in the uh, localities, the adjoining localities. Are our numbers trending higher than theirs or where the trend is higher? So. The latest variant, because it's M, no, it's XBB 1.5. <laughs> and thankfully, it doesn't seem to be any more virulent, meaning more dangerous than, than the most recent Omicron variant. So all of the variants that we've seen it since really, uh, I guess, January are all variants of Omicron. Um, this one is a combination of two of the earlier ones, the B4 and B5, at least that's my understanding. Um, but it is the most contagious so far, and it is um, the, 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 the easiest at evading our immune responses. So even people who've had it, like I have a child who's had it three times now. <laughs> he's, he's my very social, social adult. Um, He's, I mean, he, even people who've had it three times and who are, who are vaccinated are still vulnerable because this one's really good at evading that immune response. But the good news is that even though the vaccine is not perfect by any stretch, we would be lying if we said that it was a perfect um, tool. It is the best tool that we have, and we know that it does decrease the risk of hospitalization and death. It doesn't prevent you from getting it, um, but it does decrease the risk. Um, so the bottom line for me with the latest variant is it's just another in a long line. We're going to live with this thing, or hopefully we'll, we'll live with this thing. Um, it's it's going to be around. It's just part of our environment now. Um, and the variants are going to keep coming and going. Um, and as long as they don't change to be more dangerous, um, I think we're, we're okay. Um, but. I know, shocking to have me say this, the yeah. best tool that we have is our vaccine. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, right now, back to the question of activity, we're in high transmission again. We've been in high transmission for the last two weeks of reporting in Roanoke City. Um, I expect that's actually going to change this coming week, looking at the numbers. It's a little bit too early to tell. Salem and Craig are in medium transmission. All of, all of the other five... Um, Botata, Roanoke County, um, Covington, Allegheny, they're all in high transmissions as well. So that's where we are. And that's so theoretically masking is recommended when, when we're in high transmission. Uh, you, do you think that's attributed to the high numbers coming out because of the holidays with family <laughs> gatherings, et cetera? Yeah. So, so every year mm -hmm. it seems that we get a contagious variant right around the holiday mm -hmm. season. And then we just share it. Um, so I think all, all of us in public health are attributing the increase to the XBB15 um, being more contagious, being better at evading the immune response, and us getting together. So, but hopefully the worst is behind us. <laughs> thank you. You're welcome. Thank, thank you, Mr. Pretty. Mayor. So thank you, Mayor Lee. Thank you for being here, Dr. Morrow. I just have a, a follow-up uh, question looking for insight on the interventions for childhood asthma um, as it relates to how much are you seeing as it relates to vaping um, in the area being done by our youth? And then there was a recent uh, peer review study that came out that says that 12.7% of childhood asthma is seen to be caused by using gas stoves in kitchens. Yeah. And this was alerted to me by a constituent um, who's concerned about the housing authority is replacing all of their gas stoves one of their complexes with gas stoves again and um, I just to report I followed up separately on that we don't really have authority over the housing authority and separate capital expenditures there but as it relates to public health 
How are those two items related to childhood asthma as they might be seen in the area? So I think it's really important to vaping. I, I don't have a grant. I don't have that kind of granular level data for us. So I can't say in Roanoke City, vaping contributes X, Y, and Z. But we can look at our BRFSS, our, our, our youth risk factor surveillance. Um, so that's done every two years. Um, I'm looking at Chris. I think I think it's done every two years, yeah. um, and the prevent. And I'm gonna I'm gonna mess this up. They're the prevention council. They're two they're two different councils here. Yeah. Um, the youth prevention you. council. Um, I th I th I'll have to go back. But run up run up It's okay because there I I know that yeah, there's there one for the valley and one for the city, right. but I get their names mixed up, and so, I and I'm gonna go address that and learn it so that I don't mess up again. <laughs> um, but I think that it's important for us to look at those data because those are local data about what our youth are doing. Um, there's no doubt that the that from a global person, not well from a from a big <coughs> literature perspective, tobacco in the home, and some of the environmental things that that um, that Vice I, I realize I called you Joe <laughs> that Vice Mayor Cobb talked about are sort of the biggest drivers. Um, on the individual basis, absolutely vaping should be considered, and you probably can tell where I stand on vaping. No. <laughs> In terms of the gas stoves, I think it's really important for us, again, to contextualize where we are. That information is brand new. It doesn't surprise me at all. I think that for I think we'd have to look at what the distribution of gas stoves are in our highest risk populations. And in those highest risk populations, what are some of the other factors that are probably more important? Um, not to say that gas stoves aren't important, but I think that relatively speaking, when we look at our adult smoking rates, that's where we're seeing the greatest harm to our children. Um, I think it's important for us to look at all of all of those factors, um, but I think that in terms of just the evidence, I'm going to get a little bit wa wank wanky, wa wanky po policy wonky here. Um, there's something called population attributable risk, and that's where you look at not only how common is the risk factor, but how much does that risk factor contribute to that poor outcome, um, and that's where the the tie between gas stoves and asthma is a little bit looser. Does that make sense? Yeah, I feel yes. like I just like blahed. <laughs> um, but it's a great question that I would love to do sort of a deeper dive in. I don't know enough about this, the housing stock and the gas stove stock here to, to know. It, do the um, adult smoking rates um, take into account vaping? No, that's tobacco. Okay, so it'd be separate. Yeah, and as a general rule, um, vaping still is, that, I mean, this is a general rule, more common in younger people, including young adults, whereas tobacco is still in our older adults. Our, our, our youth parents are probably somewhere in between, so it's probably both. So that's a great question. Okay. Thank you. Great question. I'm going to look into that because now I, I, I don't know enough about vaping in adults. <laughs> Dr. Ma, I got one question. Yes. Could you go back to uh, the slide on child poverty and food insecurity? And let me look at your graph because I'm I'm struggling seeing my graph here. Uh, does that show Roanoke City on the food insecurity? Does that show Roanoke City with a star? It's higher. It's a little higher. Is it in most areas? Yeah, so, so Covington, um, no, no, it's Allegheny County. Um, Covington and Allegheny County have sort of gone neck and neck with some mm -hmm. of these, these risk factors. Um, but consistently, Roanoke City is, is at the top. Um, okay. But the question I have is there some uh, citizens have called me and talked about food that's being sold, especially in some of the stores in the uh, unassertive neighborhoods, that it's outdated. This person showed me uh, a pizza that he bought, 
And the date on it was June 22, and he bought the pizza in December. And he asked the owner why was he selling that, and the owner just said, I, 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 I had a sale on it. I gave him a sale. I gave him a good deal on it. But that, was, that wasn't the only one. There were others that found food that's been way outdated but still being sold. Do we have people that check in their local, I know you mentioned it's a local matter, but my concern is, is that not only are people buying outdated food, but I think they're being taken advantage of uh, by some of these people who are, who are putting stuff up that's outdated, but they because they sell it for much less than what it would have cost when it was dated, yeah. they feel it's a bargain and they're in, in some form or fashion, they think they're helping the people by giving them much outdated food. And this was just an example of one that's six months old. And I'd be curious to know if a audit, a check was done on food, just a random going in, checking and looking at dates on food that's being sold. That's a concern. And so I just want if you could address that in any way, uh, please, so please, sir. That I, and I should have been clear, we have a responsibility for safe, ready-to-eat foods, meaning restaurants. Um, Ag and Markets is responsible for stores. So we actually don't have any legal jurisdiction over retail stores at all. Um, and that's just, you know, that's just the way it's 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 written so we we couldn't go into a store and do an audit we don't have that authority to do that um, but what we can do is I can talk with our EH team and see if we can contact someone um, with uh, I don't think it's, it's with with the equivalent of ag and markets and and see what what they can do for consumer um, protections the one caution I would have is that in general, and this is again a gross, I worry that there are a lot of these things that are just gross generalizations. Out of date food, unless it's a perishable, is more about quality than safety. Um, so there aren't that many food safety concerns for an out of date frozen pizza as long as it would be more like freezer burn and it just not tasting that good. Um, now, clearly, with perishable foods, that's not true. You increase the risk of bacterial contaminations if, if something is, is old. Um, but in general, shelf-stable foods or frozen-stable foods, it's more of a quality issue than it is a safety issue. Um, but what I can definitely do is talk with our EH, because they'll have the contacts for the people who do come into the, the markets, and just ask them. And if you can give me the specifics of the stores that there are constituent concerns, we, we can facilitate that. While we can't do it, we can facilitate it. Sure. And most of them are in food deserts. There are a lot of food deserts, in, in, especially in the Northwest. Yeah. And the concern I have is the mindset of the owner. They just said, oh, well, we give them a deal on it, so it's no problem. Yeah. And it could be. And I'm thinking, you know, you know who would want to eat a piece of this dated six months old uh, because it's in the freezer? Uh, it's that mindset, and I think that happens when you know there's no real inspection going on, so you just put out that what you want to put on it. And I'm just concerned about that, especially in certain areas that are, that are food deserts and they're taking advantage of. So any guidance or help you can give us or to do and to contact the necessary Absolutely. People, we can definitely get the contact information. And I'm sorry, because that, that's, you're right. And, you know, with our wheel of equity in the, in yeah. the middle, boy, does that violate that. All right. Uh, Ms. Mayor, Thank I, you. Yeah. Uh, I just want to follow up on what the mayor was saying. Uh, I believe that uh, I know for a fact that holds true also with uh, food that is distributed through the schools that children are take home. Uh, some of that food also is like milk, for instance, has been outdated. And I've been meaning to uh, talk with uh, my colleagues about that and the school system uh, to see who regulates, <clears throat> excuse me, who regulates that to make sure that the children are not taking home sour milk yeah. or cheese, those little string cheese things that they, they eat, or even pizza, for instance. Uh, they may be six to nine months outdated, even though it may be still healthy, but I worry about the milk. Yeah, and, and, and for juice. sure, if there's anything 
Well, even if we don't have jurisdiction over it, if there's anything that we can do, we can facilitate communication, we can facilitate education. Mm -hmm. um, there, there, are, there are definitely things we can do even if we don't have jurisdiction. Right. Okay. So please feel free to let us know. And you all have my contact information. You can contact me directly um, and I'll, I'll get our EH team involved. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Anybody else before? Thank you so much oh, for thank coming. Thank you. And uh, uh, you've been a, had a great presentation. Appreciate that. And these are things we see in the community as we work, and uh, you've addressed them, and we're going to keep in contact with you. Well, we thank go. you for everything that you do, and um, we're here to help you pr protect our community's health. So anything that we can do, we'd be, we'd be privileged to do so. All right. Thank you thank so you much. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Madam Clerk, get me back online. Where am I now? We're now at 7 8. Okay. Items recommended for action. Yes. Okay. All right. Item 7A is uh, items that we recommend for action. A is acceptance and appropriation of juvenile justice and delinquency prevention funding from the Commonwealth of Virginia Department of Criminal Justice Services. There's a resolution. Move the resolution. Seconded. All right. Uh, Madam Clerk, can you please read the title paragraph? A resolution accepting the Juvenile <coughs> Justice Delinquency Prevention Grant made to the city by the Virginia Department of Criminal Justice Services and authorizing execution of any required documentation on behalf of the city. All right. And then a discussion by members of council. Vice Mayor. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, I wanted to introduce Jamie Starkey, who is here from Sam Family Service of Roanoke Valley. Um, and I don't know, Jamie, would you be willing to share just a little bit about this, these funds and the grant that's going to provide mental health services at the Envision Center? Thank you, Vice Mayor. <clears throat> thank you all for your attention today. Um, this funding is to support services for mental health at the new Envision Center at the Lansdowne community. Family Service has taken an, initi an initiative with the Roanoke Redevelopment and Housing Authority to ensure that everyone has access to mental health services in our community. We've been really successful in doing that at Jamestown Place and at Melrose Towers. And this funding will allow us to expand these services to the Envision Center in the community in Northwest Roanoke, excuse me, around Lansdowne. This funding specifically is for the prevention of delinquency. So families who have youth who are at an increased risk of juvenile justice involvement will be served through this funding. We have additional funding that will serve other families, um, older adults, for example, that may not fit into this funding category. Um, but we really look forward to having a counselor available at the Envision Center for five days a week, a uh, full-time person. It'll actually be a combination of counselors that will be serving in that community, but we hope to have someone there during regular business hours at the Envision Center. So this allows us to do that. All right. Back on the coach. It's pretty. I just want to um, we'll say thank you first to you and to be grateful for these funds that are coming to the city of Roanoke. I think it's important that when we look at justice, we look holistically at preventative measures that can be put in place, especially how much further our funding can go in helping people from staying out of trouble rather than responding to people who get in trouble. Absolutely, and we know that um, youth who are involved in the juvenile justice system often have a history of significant complex trauma. And if we can intervene and provide mental health services to the family to address that trauma, then the chances of success for these youth uh, increases exponentially. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, Ms. Uh, I just have one question, and that is, uh, and this is for the manager, uh, who is uh, the organization Together Everyone Achieves Mental Wellness Counseling? 
That is, if I can answer oh, is that, that. With you? that is that's the good. name of the program. Oh, okay, okay. Yes, when you. I just saw two separate. That's why I wanted I'm to. I'm glad you could answer that. Yes, I can answer that. <coughs> Thank you. Yes, Thank we you had to that. name the program. So okay. instead of just being family service, okay. since we offer so many programs, right. this is the particular identifier for the Envision Center services for these youth. Yes, I was aware of family yes. services working with the Housing Authority. Yes. And as uh, just for full disclosure purposes, I am a board member of Family Services of Roanoke Valley. So, uh, but I don't get paid, so I, I believe, unless the attorney tells me otherwise, I should be able to vote. You can vote. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Uh, in further discussion, from Council. Thank you so Thank much. You so Thanks much. for coming on. Thank you so much. All right, Madam Clerk, you can call the roll on this item. All right. Mr. Pretty. Aye. Vice Mayor Cobb. Aye. Ms. White Boyd. Aye. Mr. Vollison. Aye. Ms. Moon Reynolds? Aye. Ms. Sanchez Jones? Aye. And Mayor Lee? Aye. And the resolution passes. Thank you all. All right, we have a budget ordinance. Move the budget ordinance. Second. Second. All right, Madam Clerk, please read the title paragraph. An ordinance to appropriate funding from the Virginia Department of Criminal Justice Services for the Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention Grant amending and reordaining certain sections of the 2022-2023 grant fund appropriations and dispensing with the second reading by title of this ordinance. All right, is there any discussion? Let me just say, I'm very, uh, I feel good about this and I think this is something that our public ought to know that we're putting people and things in place and hopefully that will get out. So sometimes instead of hearing the criticism, what we're not doing, these are some things that's going on in the city. And I think hopefully, you know, that word will get out. And I hope we'll talk more about that when we go out individually and meet our citizens. All right, Madam Clerk, we can call the roll on this, please. Mr. Pretty. Aye. Vice Mayor Cobb. Aye. Ms. White Boyd. Aye. Mr. Vollison. Aye. Ms. Moon Reynolds. Aye. Ms. Sanchez Jones. Aye. And Mayor Lee. All right, and the budget ordinance passes. Thank you. All right, uh, item B. Uh, this is the acceptance and appropriation of the FY 2022 20, Edward Berry Memorial Justice Assistance Grant Program. Uh, there's a resolution. Move the resolution. Second. Madam Clerk, could you read the title paragraph? A resolution authorizing the acceptance of a grant from the FY 2022 Edward Byrne Memorial Justice Assistance Grant Program made to the City of Roanoke by the United States Department of Justice and authorizing execution of any required documentation on behalf of the city. All right, is there any comments or discussions or questions that any member of council may have on this? I was just wondering if the city manager could say what these funds are coming in and being used for. Sure, so there's two purposes with this, um, this particular funding. One of those is to further support the bicycle patrol program. So that'll be for equipment, bikes, helmets, those kinds of things as well. And then also for additional facility cameras that'll be used in the uh, city jail. Um, and that's at the direction of the sheriff. So those are the two items in this grant. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Any further questions? Seeing or hearing none, Madam Clerk, call the roll. Mr. Pretty. Aye. Vice Mayor Cobb. Aye. Ms. White Boyd. Aye. Mr. Vollison. Aye. Ms. Moon Reynolds. Aye. Ms. Sanchez Jones. Aye. And Mayor Lee. Aye. And we can let the sheriff know we're getting cameras for that. All right? Okay. All right, a budget ordinance. We have one. Move the budget ordinance. Second. All right, Madam Clerk, please read the title program. An ordinance to appropriate funding from the federal government, Department of Justice, for the Byrne Memorial Justice Assistance Grant Program, amending and reordaining certain sections of the 2022-2023 grant fund appropriations and dispensing with the second reading by title of this ordinance. Thank you. Uh, any discussion by members of council? Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Mr. Pretty. Aye. Vice Mayor Cobb. Aye. Ms. White Boyd. Aye. Mr. Vollison. Aye. Ms. Moon Reynolds. Aye. Ms. Sanchez Jones. Aye. Mayor Lee. Aye. And the budget ordinance passes. Thank you. 
Item C is the acceptance of Virginia Department of Transportation local revenue sharing funding for the Huntington Boulevard curb, gutter, and sidewalk uh, Bridgewood to Oliver Site 6 project. Uh, there's a resolution. Move the resolution. Second. All right, Madam Clerk, uh, can you read the title paragraph? A resolution authorizing the acceptance of the Virginia Department of Transportation local revenue sharing fund funding for the Huntington Boulevard curb, gutter, and sidewalk site six project and authorizing the execution and filing of appropriate documents to obtain such funds. All right, any discussion, comments, questions from council? Hearing none, Madam Clerk, call the roll. Mr. Pretty? Aye. Vice Mayor Cobb? Aye. Ms. White Boyd? Aye. Mr. Vollison? Aye. Ms. Moon Reynolds? Aye. Ms. Sanchez Jones? Aye. Mayor Lee? Aye. And the resolution passes. Thank you. We have a budget ordinance. Move the budget ordinance. Second. Madam Clerk, please read the title paragraph. An ordinance appropriating funding from the Commonwealth of Virginia Department of Transportation, amending and reordaining certain sections of the 2022 2023 capital projects fund appropriations and dispensing with the second reading by title of this ordinance. All right, any discussion? Comments by members of council? Hearing none, Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Mr. Pretty? Aye. Vice Mayor Cobb? Aye. Ms. White Boyd? Aye. Mr. Vollison? Aye. Ms. Moon Reynolds? Aye. Ms. Sanchez Jones? Aye. And Mayor Lee? Aye. And the budget ordinance passes. Thank you. We're now down to uh, item C, D, which is the acceptance of funds from the Economic Development Authority of the City of Roanoke for Virginia Tech Corporate Research Center, Red Lab, and uh, uh, JLB, J Lab, Go Virginia application. Uh, there's a budget ordinance. Good. Madam Clerk, read the, would you read, please read the Title <laughs> An ordinance appropriating funding from the Economic Development Authority for the City of Roanoke, amending and reordaining certain sections of the 2022-2023 grant fund appropriations, and dispensing with the second reading by title of this ordinance. Okay. Is there any discussions or comments or questions from members of council? Mayor, if I, if I may, just to give a, some insight as to what this is and. In, in, and the significance of it really on its own, but also as a um, prelude to, of course, another project that, that's underway. So this was, as it's noted, um, back in 21, an application that we shared along with some others um, from the Virginia Tech Corporate Research Center um, through the Go Virginia program, and we were successful in receiving the funding for that. This particular project is actually taking place at the Corporate Research Center there at, on Virginia Tech's campus. Um, but most significantly, it's a partnership with the Johnson & Johnson J-Lab. And, of course, that's the party that we will be working with as we use the shared lab facility um, here in, in Roanoke. So this is really kind of the first phase of that effort. And then as that morphs its way through then, uh, and once we receive the funding that was allocated by the General Assembly and the governor, then we will proceed on this location as well. So it's kind of a two-step process. This is the first one of those. And, again, this project itself built on a previous Go Virginia grant as well that um, had gotten to this far, but um, it's a significant step in moving us toward having that shared lab facility here in our community. Thank you. All right. Thank you. All right. Everybody, Mr. Pretty. Just a comment that it's exciting to be seeing this sector of the economy grow, especially in our region of Virginia. All right. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Sanchez won't go, but I think we got enough to get this done. Yeah. Call, call the roll. We'll slow. <laughs> call the roll, Madam Clerk, please. All right. Mr. Pretty. Aye. Vice Mayor Cobb. Aye. Ms. White Boyd. Aye. Mr. Vollison. Aye. Ms. Moon Reynolds. Aye. Ms. Sanchez Jones. Aye. And Mayor Lee. Aye. And the budget ordinance passes. Thank you. Item number E is the designation of census tracts 6.01 and 6.02 as a revitalization area. There is a resolution. Move the resolution. Second. 
Madam Clerk, can you read the title paragraph to this? A resolution designating census tracts 6.01 and 6.02 in the city of Roanoke, Virginia as a revitalization area. All right. Any discussion? Mayor. I have a uh, I almost call you Mayor. I know. It, it <laughs> might take a minute. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, uh, I really uh, just uh, had a, a question, not about the, uh, um, the incentive, because we really are thrilled about that. Anytime we can incentivize anyone to, to build low-income housing, it's, it's a plus. But um, Mr. Cowlett said it was in response to a specific housing development. Can you share that, or is that... Um, it's not something you can share at this yeah, point. Yeah, they are still working on a proposal for that, so we're not so, quite there yet. So this we're not quite there. That's fine. That. I was just curious. Because yeah. yeah, you say low-income housing, we all get excited. Yes. And, and this, <laughs> and in this excited. case, it, it really <laughs> genuinely will be. I mean, this is actually well, for Well, I appreciate that. And, and when the time comes, I'm sure you will share. I just thought I'd ask the question. Thank you, Mr. Yeah, I thought you were going to ask me which um, where census tract 6. That's actually oh, well, and, yeah, yeah. And, and that would tell me where, where it was going to be, baby. Yeah. It is, uh, it is located in the southeast. Southeast? Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. That's good enough for us. I saw Mr. Chittam stand up back there. Okay. Yeah. Oh, well. <laughs> I'm glad somebody knows. Well, no. <laughs> See, I'm pulling the map trying to find it. Well, speaking of wonkiness, um, uh, census tracts uh, uh, 6.01 and 0, 6.02 basically together uh, or the northeastern uh, quadrant of the city. So if you think about a line from downtown kind of out along the northern edge of Venton and then another line that extends straight up, so 12 o'clock to 2.30 of the city is basically those two, and they're very, very large because there is very little population out in that area, and it is increasing very quickly. Um, uh, we, we see the most housing uh, development activity uh, in this quadrant right now. So not only would this, uh, this designation facilitate some things that are, that are happening right now, but also future uh, low-income housing uh, tax credit projects. Do you know how many acres these two tracks uh, of, the, of the two? Uh -huh. Oh, uh, a thousand just, or, or more. Wow. Uh, it's a very, very wow. large area. I mean, it has a, golf, a couple of golf courses the Kegley Farm, two large industrial parks, uh, okay. and, and, and it, it's just, it's just uh, uh, a very large geographic area. Oh, thank you. That, ha Lord that has quite more. a bit of vacant land in it. It's a little, about six and a half square miles. Okay. Oh, wow. Yeah. That, oh, I'm looking forward to yeah. hearing yeah. more about that. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I do have a Going on. Uh, uh, Chris, this may be for you or either Bob, uh, where you mentioned uh, revitalization of existing housing for low-income residents. When we look at affordable housing, at least I do, do you know what range, price range we're talking about when we talk about affordable? They'll calculate that uh, based on the area median income and so essentially uh, something that uh, where uh, someone would spend no more than 30 percent of their income okay. um and you know it, it's math but but really uh that's the that's where the cap is and and so they would they would take that figure that out and that's where they would set uh the rents uh, so can for, you kind of guess so give me a guesstimation uh i'm going to say it's around eight to nine hundred dollars okay per month that's what i mean yes yeah. that yeah. helps just for the viewing audience so, when we talk of yeah. uh, when you hear low income affordable housing sure you just try to see if, what that range is and of course it matters on on uh, what who's whose uh median income you use mm -hmm. is it just the city or the entire yeah, region the census, yeah right. the yeah oh, well, not I, I, you, but they, I, I think right. generally th what they do is use the regions uh, the, the MSA the or the Metropolitan uh, Statistical or Area. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so and then necessarily for a low income person if you're looking at the resident versus the region. That's right. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, thank you. Chris, before you leave today, can I see you not on this issue, it's another issue that you and I have in common. I going to talk about habitat. I want to talk for you. Okay. Uh no further discussion. We're ready to vote. Madam Clerk, call over. All right. Mr. Pretty? Aye. 
Vice Mayor Cobb. Aye. Ms. White Boyd. Aye. Mr. Vollison. Aye. Ms. Moon Reynolds. Aye. Ms. Sanchez Jones. Aye. And Mayor Lee. Aye. And the resolution passes. Thank you. All right. We're on the in the part of the agenda where we have comments. Uh, from the city manager, so I'll call on our city manager for comments. You Thank may you, have. Mr. Mayor. And no, uh, no comments uh, this evening because I know we have a lot of things that we need to do in, in between the two meetings. So thank you. Okay. Uh, item number eight is reports of committees. Eight one is a report of Roanoke City School Board requesting appropriation of funds for various educational programs and a report of the city manager recommending the council concur in the request. Donna Caldwell, <laughs> director of accounting, is a spokesperson. Uh, there's a budget ordinance. Move the budget ordinance. All right. Madam Clerk, can you read the title paragraph? Second. Oh, I thought. They got it. Do we have they a second? They, they got it. They got a second. Yeah. Okay. All right, the title paragraph. An ordinance to appropriate funding from the Commonwealth federal and private grant for various educational programs amending and reordaining certain sections of the 2022-2023 school grant fund appropriations and dispensing with the second reading by title of this ordinance. All right. Any discussion by members of council? Hey, none. Madam Clerk, call the roll, please, on this budget ordinance. Mr. Pretty. Aye. Vice Minute. Vice Mayor Cobb. Aye. Ms. White Boyd. Aye. Mr. Vollison. Aye. Ms. Moon Reynolds. Aye. Ms. Sanchez Jones. And she is away. And Mayor Lee. Aye. All right. Uh, it, yes, the budget on this passes. Uh, all right, we're now down to a report of certain authority boards, committees, and commissions in which city council serves as liaisons or appointees. Uh, are there any comments by members of council? Yes, Mr. Mayor. Let's go. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I'd like to offer um, a brief report from the GRTC board, Greater Roanoke Transit Company board. We had our meeting today and, and um, Coming before you now is a walk-on for a resolution that we um, that affirms a decision we made um, in our meeting today. Um, so, before we get to that resolution, I just wanted to give you a couple of highlights uh, from the meeting. Uh, construction uh, for the new transit center is moving along really well. Uh, the north canopy is currently under construction. We're at about 65% completion. We're still anticipating um, a full completion of everything, uh, potentially in April, which is ahead of schedule, which is very exciting. Um, so watch for that ribbon cutting, Mayor. All right. Okay. Um, the um, VMGO app is active and it's very user friendly. If you have not downloaded the app, I encourage you to do so. It's real time. It shows the, the current schedule of the buses. If you turn on the locator feature, it, it will tell you where the nearest routes are, that, where you can catch the bus, depending on where you're located. Um, and it lets you know whether the bus is on time, whether it's running behind schedule. So there are a lot of great features to that. Ridership continues to be up about 10%. Um, the other piece of the construction that will be happening is really the addition of technology. So um, outside of the station, there will be uh, screens that will show when the buses are arriving, when they're leaving, if they're on schedule, off schedule. And all of the buses are equipped with um, new technology, which ties in with the app. Uh, and so it, it, there's not only verbal confirmation of where you are on the route, but there's visual confirmation as right. well. So a lot of good um, improvements being made. So um, I'd like to present, um, move this resolution, um, which essentially uh, implements a fare free transit equity day on Saturday, February 4th of this year, which is also Rosa Parks birthday. And this is a kind of a national effort, but we wanted to give some recognition of it here yeah. locally. That's great. Is there a second? Second. 
All right. Madam Clerk, can you read? <laughs> I see too much. Can you read the title <laughs> paragraph? Yes, sir. A resolution approving and affirming the action taken by the Greater Roanoke Transit Company doing business as Valley Met Metro to implement free fair free transit equity day service for Saturday, February 4th, 2023, and authorizing the city manager to take any necessary action to accomplish such fair. Thank you. It was a great day in Roanoke. I tell you, I think I'm very much appreciative of this. And uh, under the uh, <coughs> guidance and who's the chairman of this GRTC? Vice Mayor Cobb. I know, I was just wanting to pull that out there. <laughs> This is good work, and I think uh, I was going to question, I was going to ask February 4th, but you said it's Rosa Parks' huh? birthday. Mm -hmm. birthday. Good, that's, that's great. Yeah, yeah and there, the, um, there's actually an advocacy group called uh, BRAG, Bus Riders of Roanoke Advocacy Group, and they're planning, working with Valley Metro to plan a, kind of a day-long series of activities and events at the Transit Center. Well, thank you. Congratulations on that work, and uh, any members of council at any comments on that okay got a report I'm coming right to you all right actually I better comment on that I look forward to the day when we can get have every day be fair free day <laughs> <laughs> yeah. that's a ways down the road uh, <laughs> Councilman Dawson you're not in Northern Virginia <laughs> all right if there are no further comments uh, I'll ask the clerk to not I have a comment but not regarding this okay uh, Not now. Okay. Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? Mr. Pretty? Aye. Vice Mayor Cobb? Aye. Ms. White Boyd? Aye. Mr. Vollison? Aye. Ms. Moon Reynolds? Aye. Ms. Sanchez Jones? Aye. And Mayor Lee? Aye. And the resolution passes. Thank you, Mr. Spencer, for your work in getting all this job in. Thank you, everybody. We'll do more Karimi work to make sure that we can turn that around. Okay, great, great. All right. All right, uh, we're still in the area of any daughter's board committees. Any comments from members of council? Um, yes, Trish Mr. Mayor, uh, if I could just um, give an update on the Equity and Empowerment Advisory Board, also known as the EEAB. I will um, just give you a few highlights because I know that we are, the clock is ticking. Um, we have gotten numerous res uh, recommendations, and first of all, I would like to thank Angie O'Brien for helping me keep track of these recommendations because the committees are on fire and they are submitting one recommendation after the other, and thank you so much for helping me keep track of these. Um, we've gotten several from Neighborhood Choice. Um, we've gotten one from Inclusive Culture, which I would like to, to go over that. They had asked that we preserve the civic engagement focus of Leadership College and to review the content of Leadership College and how the city functions. And in response to that, the EEAB, the Leadership College is offered virtually and in person. And most people who apply for the Leadership College are chosen to participate. That was one of the questions. Uh, service Delivery also had a recommendation. Trust um, recently had a recommendation, which I thought was really important to highlight. The Trust Committee recommends that Citizen Review Committee responsible for reviewing and recommending funding to City Council for the City's Neighborhood Development Grants and Community Block Grants be appointed and or selected by City Council or by a City Staff Member, which is not what was done in the past. And in response to that, the city manager now reviews and approves the citizen review panel for the community development block grants. So we think um, overall that is certainly an improvement. Um, the last recommendation uh, we're going to take some action on later today also came out of the trust committee. Um, and it is recommending that we name the uh, federal POF building um, to the Reuben E. Lawson federal building because the Equity and Empowerment Advisory Board Trust Committee did not feel that um, the actions of um, Mr. Poff were in line with the city and, um, and our goals. Uh, one reason being the resolution, uh, I mean, that Mr. Poff signed off on the Declaration of Constitutional Principles known informally as the Southern Manifesto 
which is in opposition to racial integration of public places and voted against the Civil Rights Act of 1957, 1960, 64, and 68. I mean, he was determined um, <laughs> that we would not vote. Hmm. So that, uh, for those reasons, and there are a lot of other reasons that will be listed in the resolution that we have asked that um, uh, council considers doing a resolution. Of course, you know, we can't change it, but we can offer a resolution to um, the federal um, to ask that they change the name. And that is going to be on our agenda today. And, and that um, will conclude my report, Mayor. But I have asked that um, my colleagues be given a council, uh, I mean, a copy of all of the uh, all of the, the responses and recommendations so that you will have it because I know it's just too much for us to go over today. So you'll Thank get you. a copy. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Pretty. Uh, mine is not a report of a committee because the legislative committee has not met yet, but I would just like to report the legislative session is underway. Um, lots of bills are going through. None have made it all the way through each chamber yet. There is one resolution I'd like to point out. Um, Delegate Jay on board of Hampton has put in that would make October 4th um, and every year thereafter Henrietta Lacks Day. And the first, oh. the, the first line does notice that she is a native of Roanoke. Great. That's Great. Awesome. That's awesome. Uh, and she's proposing what date again? October 4th. October 4th. I'm hoping that's around the time yeah. that we have our, the statue here for her. Uh, yeah, they, our, our goal is October, and it could uh, happen sooner, but, you know, we, we're we looking at October for that to be, uh, to be ready to, to, to be unveiled. Well, we want to... I'd ask that you'll consider putting uh, that legislator on the invite list to come if we were able to do we that. We will certainly do that. Mr. Pretty, please remind me. I will. As, as vice chair of the legislative committee, I'll make sure you know. <laughs> oh, that's right. Okay. All right, uh, Ms. Sanchez-Jones. I just need to um, get some clarification by a statement that um, – Ms. Moon Reynolds made about the school and their lunch, the food that they get sent home after, with the kids after school. Could you repeat that again because I missed uh, yes. something. Uh, yes, during the summer months uh, when the schools were closing, they were sending additional food home. And uh, when the kids could come and pick up the food, uh, I had a call and I, and I got pictures of it during a time of outdated uh, food that was sent home to them. So that's as best I could clear it up for you. Um, was this from the school or an after-school program that had nothing to it do with the school? It was from the school, Viv. It came from the schools. It was from William Fleming High School, if I need to be more specific. Yeah, because, okay. you know, milk that sits around for six months, yes. I don't think it's... It was outdated, Viv. That's the best I could tell you, Okay. Honey. Thank you for You're your welcome. clarification. You're welcome. Okay. Well, thank you all. Any more uh, with comments? on certain boards. I want to say that I was just flabbergasted by uh, the Puff building and mm -hmm. that gentleman just kept signing it yeah. each year. He just kept Southern signing. Southern Manifesto. Wow. Yes. Uh, well, I tell you, learn something new all the time. All right. Thank you all for the comments. If there are no other, we'll move right on down to item number nine, which is unfinished business. We have none. Introduction and consideration of ordinances and resolutions, none. Uh, item number 11 is motion and miscellaneous business. Uh, any inquiry or comments by the mayor and or members of city council? All right, let me go down the line. This is, everything looks to be on this side. Right now, we'll come back. Right now. I, I'll go down, <laughs> starting with you, uh, Ms. Trish White Board, and then I'll go to Ms. Moon Reynolds, and then I'll come back to Ms. Perry. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> I am quite sure that all of us have gotten inquiries about our recent real estate tax assessments, and certainly uh, there needs to be some discussion, primarily the impact that any kind of adjustment will have on our current budget. Um, I just want to start from a historical perspective, going back to the briefing that we had a couple weeks ago. And uh, based on the last report, which went back to 2000, where we showed a modest increase a 4.44%, and the highest increase in values we have seen in decades in 2006 at 8.7%. But we all remember 2008 when we started to see a downturn in the economy 
and in the value of real estate, which took a hit, getting us as low as a negative 1.2%. And this went on for almost a decade before we finally started to see it recover, which was really around 2017 when they started to come back again at 2.8%, uh, 2.18%. And again, in, in 2021, we had 2.59%. And it was just last year in 2022 that we saw some growth in our real estate values at 7.65%. And this was from our briefing um, that real estate valuation gave us a couple of weeks ago. So it took a while for us to come back from the downturn. And based on historical trends, I would imagine that we could see another downturn. But aside from that, I'd like for us to, to consider also this from a fiscal perspective and stewards of the taxpayers' dollars. We should be concerned um, and, and really think hard about the impact of reducing the tax rate uh, when we have committed to several capital improvement projects, one being the Main Street Bridge, which we really have to address that. Eureka Park, uh, I know the community is looking forward to a brand new uh, rec center, the Williamson Road Fire Station that really needs to be replaced, and the Washington Park Pool. I mean, thank God we're finally looking at that Washington Park Pool. It's been leaking for I don't know how long uh, or, or how many years. So those are some of the things that we have lined up. Not to mention that we have one of the biggest economic development projects coming up that we uh, have seen really in decades, which will be in Southeast. And, and you know, we'll be talking more about that later today. But I just wanted to, to make sure that we keep some of these things in mind and don't forget that we have promised some of our employees pay increases. Some of them were here today. Um, our, our solid waste folks and our public safety people, DSS, they need a raise. Actually, based on this compensation study, there are a lot of our employees that, um, that need a raise or an, and are looking for a raise. But one of the other things that I found out, because I, I really know that, that um, some of our uh, residents need some, some uh, adjustments. And we have to remind them that there is an appeal process because some people are struggling. And some people really do need a tax rate uh, uh, reduction, I mean, uh, to, uh, to reevaluate those real estate properties. And, and there is a way to do that. And the avenue is the um, real estate appeal. But I did a little bit of research on my own. And, and the question is, who would we really be helping by lowering the tax rate? because the population that is economically disadvantaged are in Northwest, where 35% are renters. They don't even own their home. And in Southeast, 36% are uh, renters, compared to 22% in Northeast and Southwest at 25%. So I looked even further, and I took a snapshot at various neighborhoods. The Williamson Road neighborhood, one of them, has 51% renters. The Gainsborough neighborhood has 67%. Washington Park, 53. Melrose Rugby, 53. Loudon Melrose, 66%. Harrison and Gilmer, both over 65% renters, which is where we need to be focusing on, getting these folks into their own home. One of the other ones that shocked me was um, Fallon Park neighborhood, 46% renters. Belmont, 56%, and Morningside, 47 And the only neighborhood in Southwest was Hurt Park at 61%. That, um, I mean, it was one of the neighborhoods with a high rental. And, you know, we forget that, South, uh, that Hurt Park is in Southwest, but it is indeed in Southwest. 61% of those folks are renters uh, compared to the average of Southwest as a whole at 22%. So... You know, are we going to be helping the people that really need it who are economically challenged? Or are we going to be helping some wealthy investors who, who may or may not even live in Roanoke City? Because these folks don't own these homes. So I really want us to, to take a look at that and think about that because we really want to help the people who need um, to look at this real estate tax assessment. But we want to make sure that we're helping the people that need it. And also keep in mind, uh, in 2021, we had 132 appeals. In 2020, we had 184. I mean, this is compared to tens of thousands of residents 
So that number was pretty small. So I know there's a, you know, a lot of information. I just put a lot of information out there. But, but I just want us to really think about you know, how we can help the people that need to have their, their properties revalued. And, and that is the appeal process. Don't you know, take away from the, uh, the folks who, who, who really need their raises, the guys that came in front of us today, the public safety, the uh, solid waste. And, and all of the folks who are, who are depending on this compensation study to get some re relief in their pay. And I know that was a lot of information to put out there, Mayor, but I appreciate the time. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Very interesting information. Uh, all right. Did I go? I'm going right down the line. Well, Mr. Walsh. I'd just like to comment on what, what Trish said. You know, um, when we're looking at what we're doing with our budget, we need to make sure that, you know, if we take it down a couple of cents here and there, what is that going to do to our budget, our capital, capital financing that we've been talking about? And of course, that that's going to be helping a lot of landlords and maybe not as many of the, those that are, are in need. Um, so if we do look at the tax rate, I, you know, I think it's very important for us to look ahead. Um, you know, just like 2008, when you, know, you want, was it, you want to uh, pay for, fix the roof while the sun is shining, <laughs> right? right? So let's fix the roof while the sun is well, shining sun is shining, yeah. because uh, you know, rain clouds are starting to form on the horizon. I, I agree. All right, Ms. Moon. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you both, uh, Peter and uh, uh, Trish, for that. I uh, had contacted my colleagues to ask about uh, their thoughts on uh, having this discussion. So we have started the discussion, but it came out of my monthly meeting with the city manager where I spoke with him about concerns conveyed by citizens that were conveyed to me, <coughs> excuse me, regarding the proposed large percentage increases in real estate property valuations. And I was asking for a conversation, which we are having here now. Doing, uh, I was hoping that during the upcoming monthly budget briefings, just to see uh, about any possible options that may be available to offset uh, the city's residential uh, assessed values, and also for the manager to be able to share the potential impact that it would have if we looked at uh, changing the assessment rate. Uh, on the budget, and uh, we have started to have that conversation. But I just wanted to put it out there on the table so that the residents could hear that we were concerned and that we were trying to see what was available. And at this point, we are finding that there may be nothing because uh, the real estate tax rate uh, or the real estate uh, property tax that we receive as revenue is what 43% of the budget. So that is a high end, and as the manager has said, uh, that compensation and some of the things that Trish had mentioned uh, are tied to that. But I just wanted to have that conversation so that the public would be aware that we were concerned and that we, hear, we do hear you and that uh, the market is trending upward, but, there is no, but we know from past experiences that there is the possibility of another recession on the way. But I did just want to put that on the table, and that was my basis for wanting to have that on the agenda for discussion. Thank you. And, and I will just um, uh, add to that, Ms. Moon Reynolds. I, it wasn't because of your um, conversation or your meeting with, with, um, with Mr. Cowell. It was because I got inquiries. Right, and that's why yeah. I wanted to put it yeah, on the I, table. I was going to say, yes. I, got and I think we all I, got yes. inquiries. And that's yeah. what I was saying, yeah. that uh, when I spoke with you all, we all had, had yeah, received had all inquiries, inquiries, but I wanted to bring it before yeah. us uh, early enough, if, like the manager had said to me, if there was going to be some changes, he needed to hear from Do us now, yeah. and not when he started to build the budget, and then you come forward. Yeah. So that's why I wanted to be proactive in that to say, we, we were just wanting to have, have that discussion. discussion. I know. I felt just like I needed to, let it know. to, to let respond know. to the to the inquiries that I yes. have. This was just a, res a personal yes. response from the inquiries that I got yes. from from residents, and I wanted to let them know why. Yes. I wanted to caution us, uh, you know, and, and and for all the reasons I stated. Thank you, Mr. Yes. Mayor. Thank you, sir. All right. And but also, Mayor, if I could, if I still have the floor, I just had some good news that I wanted to share. Uh, that uh, was our community announcements that I called them. I like the feel goods. Well, I'll tell you what, before you do that, okay. because I want to go and make sure oh, okay. that we deal with the issue oh, at hand know. before okay. we go to okay. that. Uh, Ms. sanchez John. Yes. I just want to piggyback on what Ms. Uh, White Boy said, uh, but I want to remind the public that 40% of the revenues that we collect goes to the schools. We talk about our children being our greatest asset. Well, 
if we take that money away from them, then we're not going to be able to pay the teachers uh, their wages, our staff, and as well as increasing the number of schools. Right now, our children are, our schools are overpacked, are packed to the max. So therefore, we need to be looking into being good stewards of the money and look into expanding, creating new schools. Uh, at the high school level, we need another high school. And um, in order for the teachers to stay on board, they, they need to get paid as a, in a competitive uh, salary. So therefore, we need to give our children the best that we could give them when it comes to education. And 40% of that money will go towards their education. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Pooh, did you have anything? Uh, thank you, Mayor Lee. A few things, and I'll try to go quickly. Um, but first, continuing on this current conversation, um, I, I do think that uh, more of this discussion would be more appropriate for February 6th during our um, financial budget work session. And we should have plenty of time to continue this conversation until April 25th, when there will be a public hearing on the budget and the tax rates. So this conversation doesn't necessarily need to end today, nor does it need to happen today. Um, uh, otherwise, I, I wanted to bring up a, an issue um, of, of something encountered uh, last year uh, during the election season uh, regarding the Peters Creek precinct. Okay. Let me, uh, and I appreciate, hold that thought yes. because I'm going to go, since you've gone to another area, I'm going to go to Ms. Moon, I'm going to what your thoughts are, and then we'll come back. Okay. Mine, like I said, is only just a few highlights. Uh, there's, uh, this comes from the upcoming TAP event I was shared, that was shared with me. Uh, January the 21st, uh, Envision Your Vision uh, Youth Event, an afternoon of fun and creativity for middle and high school students. Students will go home with their own vision uh, board dedicated to the short-term and long-term goals. If anyone is interested, they can contact TAP. And also there are ongoing TAP events, elementary youth mentoring program for grades three and through five. And that happens on every Tuesday and Thursday doing after school programs. Uh, sessions focus on self-love, conflict resolution, goal setting, effective communication, middle school youth mentoring every Monday and Saturday. Uh, the sessions focus on self-love, conflict resolution, goal setting, <coughs> excuse me, career exploration, building an entrepreneurial mindset. And that is uh, put on by Nicole Ross. If you're interested in that, contact her through TAP. Uh, there's also an African American Studies class. And this one is open to the general public. The classes cover history, community bonding, critical thinking, and leadership skills. And you can contact Latifa Trent through TAP. And also on February the 1st, uh, TAP has a free tax clinic. The clinic is by appointment only, and if you're interested in that, you can also uh, contact TAP. And also, this one is through the city, college and career workshops, January 21st and 28th, from 12 to 2 p.m. at the Gainesburg Public Library. During the two-part workshop, there will be speakers from local colleges, on hand to assist teens on how to fill out college applications, how to research post high school options, and also how to outline a college resume or essay, and much more. And if you're interested in that, you can call 853-2540. And that's all I have. Can, can you make sure, Ms. Moon, that the clerk has that? Yes, I use it pass all of that to her. Oh, yes, yeah, I do. I give her all that. Sign up for some yes. stuff. Yes. Yes. Okay, thank you. Yes. Thank you. All right, uh, go ahead, Mr. Pretty, and I'll finish. This relates uh, to elections and, and last year issues that voters faced at the Peters Creek Precinct. Um, this was a result of an action taken last April at a council meeting where uh, the precinct realignment um, set uh, the precinct to be the voting place as William Fleming High School, but the address that's set in the code is based on Ferncliff rather than Ordway where the precinct is accessible. And I think that led to a number of voters who had issues on that evening. It's my understanding that even if we're just going to be changing the address and it's not realignment, that we have to um, publicize what those changes are and that we want to work with the electoral board, possibly the school system, to make sure that it'd be appropriate to move an address to Ordway Drive because everyone would have to get a new registered voter card. That 
I don't think this was much of an issue during the last primary um, because only 26 people voted in person that day. A lot of people voted early, but last year during November, there, there were some issues faced. I don't think that they were incredibly serious given that uh, at, I saw it from the State Board of Elections. No one filed a formal complaint with them, although I do think that there were complaints received locally. And it's something I hope that the Electoral Board are uh, newly appointed and soon to be reorganized electoral board, the registrar and the school system could work on together just so we could start getting that advertised and have whatever action needs to take place here um, roughly 45 days after that's advertised. But advertising it, uh, Mr. Pretty, or do we need to correct that address? Well, so, go ahead. I, I was just going to say, when, that day while I was directing traffic yeah, yeah. <laughs> around the corner, uh, I was talking with Anna Goltz, who's on the, is continuing on the electoral board, and she said that there's, uh, they have to put the physical legal address of the, the facility. The facility. There isn't a physical legal address for the annex gym, which is where, where the voting is held, and that was part of the dilemma. So I think if we can, to Luke's point, if we can work with them to figure out a better mechanism, and I'd also like to know if that, if, if at some point, this is because Ruffner is under construction. Yeah. Is at some point the the idea that the precinct is going to come back to Ruffner after it's the uh, vocational technical center? And if that's the case, it, I, I'd like to know, is this a temporary relocation for the precinct or a permanent? And then take that into consideration if we're... No, it's I, I would ask that you just send a letter to the electoral board and ask for a report back to see what actually would be appropriate. That editorial oh, yeah. board that electoral board. if we might, Ms. Mayor, we can do it even quicker. I've already based on uh, right. your conversation with me at the budget retreat. I've alerted the registrar and I think we can get it Good. done that way much more quickly than a formal letter. Mm -hmm. But I'll be working with Mr. Mayor if it's okay, if I could work with Mr. Pretty so that we can get the resolution, uh, get this issue resolved in a manner that he feels comfortable with, and I think the registrar feels comfortable. Thank you. Yes, sir. Local yes, sir. government is rather okay. effective. All uh, right. Thank you for that. Um, the, the, the final point doesn't need to be so much discussion now. It's just a request of um, if and when there was going to be a continuing conversation on curfew that was brought up last time, or if that was just something that was yeah. mentioned as a, a back burner. I plan for that to be that we're not ready now, but I've been uh, uh, – there are a few things I want to know, but if you all have any thoughts on that, you can send that to me, uh, and I'll pass it along as we develop. Yeah, uh, I wish there were a way we could uh, survey the parents who, uh, uh, and see what, they, what their thoughts well, are. Well, I, I don't want to go that big. <laughs> I mean, we got enough bureaucracy as it is, and surveys and studies. We studied it out. I mean, we all know. I know what they're going to say. I see them all the time. Yeah. They tell me what they want. I, that's why I, I did that, because they say what they, want. what they want. You know, they want more police, one thing, and, and a lot of other things, but I want to protect the kids. That's what that's all about. Uh, and I'll be in touch with uh, Mr. Spencer to see what has to come about with that. But it's still active. It's still, uh, in my from, from my perspective, it's still alive and something that we want to look at. But I want to get your inputs on it and thoughts on certain things. All right, I will send you my notes. Okay. Uh, and then finally, if anyone was going to announce the uh, Eureka Center redevelopment meeting that was brought up last time, we now have a meeting location. I wasn't sure if you had mentioned that earlier. If the city manager can yeah. mention that's that's a week from today. But if you have the details, I don't have them brought up here. Yeah, yeah, I was going to say, because okay. last time we mentioned it, they didn't have the... the I, I believe it's at the Math Academy. Academy. It's, at, it's at Ram. Is it the Ram? Yeah, Ram. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, Ram. Okay. I just can't recall where it is. Okay. okay. Yeah, but I don't remember if it's in a particular room or... or... I'll have that. They have a location now. Yep. If everyone's looking. And it's up. actually out. Today. It's it's out on the website on Facebook and some other um, communications and stuff with it as well. Okay. Uh, Tishway Boy. <laughs> thank, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, this is just a point of pers personal privilege. I would like to introduce or have her say hello, my uh, new administrative assistant slash personal assistant that will be helping me keep things straight. Uh, Bree, will you stand up and wave to Miss <laughs> Bree? Miss Bree Aarons. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Mayor. She, say that again. She's out. Uh, she, she's, she's my personal assistant, oh, my new administrative okay. assistant. Yeah, she. I needed some help since. Uh, so, so she's it. 
she took it on. So I hope she's not scared off after today. But uh, <laughs> okay. she should be. She'll be back tonight for just a little bit. But thank you, Bree, for coming. Thank you. Good to meet you. All right, uh, Madam Clerk, I'm gonna come back to you again. I think we're on motions and miscellaneous matters, business. We're done with that. There are no yes. vacancies on certain authority boards, commissions, and committees. Mr. Mayor, I do have a, a, I believe what I think is a correction there. So my resignation letter for Parks and Recreation was accepted at the December meeting, and I don't think a vote has taken place on seeking a, uh, a replacement for that person. I think the website, um, the vacancies are a little bit out of date. I just know a couple individuals have submitted themselves for consideration, and there hasn't been a request for a closed meeting, so I don't think it's appropriate for us to discuss it today unless we walk that on very quickly. But I, there is at least one opening that I'm aware of. And that has been assigned, Luke. That was assigned in December, um, oh. it and it was assigned to me. It was. Yeah. No, the Parks and Recreation Advisory Yes. Board. Yeah, and, and your resignation was on the consent was on agenda. The, consent agenda. The, the resignation was accepted. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, okay, but has the appointment taken place? No, 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 no. no, no, no. It was just assigned, and we would, we would be discussing it in February, in February at the first, first meeting in February. Okay, yes. so, so it's appropriate for you to be listed as none, even though the vacancy hasn't been filled yet. That's correct. correct. Okay. Yes. Yeah. yes. All right, thank you all. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, uh, we're going to be in recess, uh, standing recess for some closed meetings, and we will reconvene at 7 o'clock here in the chamber. Thank you.